Good morning and welcome to Blackburn and Seafield Church. It's lovely to be with you all again today and I hope that you are keeping well and safe. As we worship today, I hope that we experience something of the Lord's presence and his peace. And I hope that you know how precious you are to God. The church is open on a Wednesday night, 7 till 8 o'clock, and Sunday afternoon, 2 till 3, if anyone would like some private prayer, prayer time in the church. We're planning to open the church on Sunday, the 9th of August. Following the Scottish Government's guidelines on two metre social distancing, we are only having 35 single or 50 couple places in the church. So in order to accommodate everyone, we will be having two services on a Sunday, one at 11 o'clock and another at two o'clock. You will find details of which service you should attend in the August edition of the Tally Lamp, which will be delivered to you soon. Come, bring your mustard seed of hope. Bring your yeast of expectation, your treasure of thanksgiving. Bring the perils that are your prayers. Bring the net of your lives. Come, you who are called, you who are justified, you who are glorified. Come, for it is the Lord Jesus who calls you. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, man of parable and prayer, give us the courage of the mustard seed that we might not be overwhelmed by our smallness. Son of God, give us the patience of yeast that we might not try to rush that which needs time. Give us the vision of the man in the field that we might recognize treasure when we unearth it. Through your Holy Spirit, Lord, give us the wisdom of the merchant, that we might give all that we have for that which is truly precious, and give us the strength of the net, that we might bear all things in life and not be torn until your kingdom comes. Thank you, God, for our friends who are like treasure and who make the fields of our lives safe and fun. We thank you for the special times which are like perils when we really sense your presence with us. We thank you for those who help us to see what is good and bad in our lives, what we should keep and what we should throw away. We thank you that every part of our life and every part of who we are is precious to you, however small we feel. Forgive us, loving God, when we stop looking for treasure and give up reading your word. Forgive us when we give up the yeast of our faith and our lives go flat. Forgive us when we don't cast out our nets, but stay on shore, complacent and unenthusiastic. And in this moment of silence, we bring before you the ways in which we have let you down. Forgive us, inspire us, and renew us in Jesus' name, who taught us when we come together to see. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite Alan Baker to read our scripture lesson for today. Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 35 and verses 44 to 52. He told them in another parable, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Although it is the smallest of the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest garden plant and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. <clears throat> he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that women took 
and mixed with about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke to all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them within the, without using a parable. He was then fulfilled and spoke through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables and I will utter the things hidden since the creation of the world. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When the man found it, he hid it again. And then his joy went and he sold the, what he had brought and he brought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of, the, of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and brought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore. Then they sat down, collected the fish in baskets and threw the bad ones away. This is how it will be at the end of age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteousness and throw them all into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? asked Jesus. Yes, they replied. He said to them, <clears throat> before every teacher of the law has to become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is where the owner of the house who brings out the, of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. May the Lord add his blessings to these holy words. What is heaven like? I believe we human beings have a perception problem. We often think we have the proper perspective on an issue when in fact we are way off the mark. Thomas Wheeler and his wife were driving along the motorway when the light came on in the car telling him that he needed petrol. Thomas went off the motorway at the next exit and soon found a service station. He filled the car with petrol and headed off to the kiosk to pay. As he was returning to the car, he noticed that an attendant and his wife were engaged in an animated conversation. The conversation stopped as he walked to the car and the attendant walked away. As he was getting into the car, he saw that the attendant was waving and heard him say, it was great talking to you. As he drove out of the petrol station, Thomas asked his wife if she knew the man. She readily admitted that she did. They had gone to high school together and had dated for about a year. Boy, you were lucky that I came along, bragged Thomas. If you had married him, you'd be the wife of a petrol station attendant instead of the wife of a chief executive officer. My dear, replied his wife, if I had married him, he'd be the chief executive officer and you'd be the gas station attendant. Yes, we often think we have the proper perspective on an issue when in fact we are way off. Jesus understood this tendency for us humans to get it wrong, especially when it comes to spiritual things. So he told a few parables. He said the kingdom of heaven is like this. A small seed, a mustard seed to be precise. Why did Jesus choose such a small item to represent something so large as heaven? He did this because even though the kingdom of heaven is enormous, we often are blind to its presence. Do you hear the irony in Jesus' words? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, then you'll know what a ridiculous statement this is. They are as, they're as small as a grain of sand. You can literally hold thousands of them comfortably in the palm of your hand. Yet it grows into a very large bush, large enough for birds to build their nest among its branches. What is Jesus saying? He's saying God is at work 
even although our human eyes often fail to see or understand what is happening. As Christians, we understand this, that small things have real influence, but we live in a society that is enamoured by bigness. We have gone beyond big churches to mega churches. We are overwhelmed by the bedazzling, by huge social problems, such as world hunger, wars, children in crisis, and add to that now, coronavirus. As a result, we sometimes overlook the tiny seed problems that are at the root of so many causes of these difficult situations. As you may know, the Space Shuttle program um, was grounded for several weeks due to the crack in a fuel line. We are reminded about the tiny rubber O-ring, about three tenths of an inch wide. To look at a tiny O-ring that small would not impress anyone. And yet, 15 years ago, two of those rings were placed in the aft left joint of a sol the solid rocket booster to stop gases from escaping. Whether it was the unusually cold weather, uh, a contaminated uh, introduced into the zinc putty used on them, any number of potential com com um, compression problems or human error during manufacturing, these two miniature O-rings failed to do what they were designed to do and the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded before the watching world, 73 seconds into her flight, claiming the lives of all seven crew members. It's the little things, tiny viruses the size of a pinhead, spread through coughs and sneezes and touch, heart valves no larger than a man's thumbnail, single votes in an election, an ill-chosen word from someone we love. Little things have tremendous power. Matthew 13 records the story Jesus told about the smallest things his audience could identify with, a mustard seed. We shouldn't underestimate the impact of little events. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of patience to work with people. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of love to redeem a situation. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of grace to bring about healing. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of understand, understanding to save a marriage. On the 14th of May, I was out walking Sammy and Jet in the park when I took an epileptic seizure. I've had a few, the last one being five years ago. As I came around, I saw a young girl, Erin, who had seen me on the grass and thought I was sunbathing. Well, the sun was shining. When I hadn't moved, she came over and phoned her dad, who was another dog walker, who phoned for an ambulance. I got up and somehow phoned Lawson and he came over and got me. I was checked by the paramedics in full PPI and then next day by Dr. Lavery. And a few days later, Lawson and I went over to Erin's house to thank her for her help and her kindness. Two weeks ago, Erin's dad and mum appeared unexpectedly at the man's door, obviously upset. And it turned out that Erin's gran had died and her dad wanted me to take her funeral. It was good to see them again, but not under the circumstances. It seemed important to them that it was not a stranger who would be taking Erin's grand's funeral. They had met me before. So many of God's greatest happenings are unobtrusive and hardly noticeable. They seem of little or no significance, but how great are their ultimate importance? Let me tell you that when God moved in history for the salvation of mankind, he didn't do so with a legion of angels or some grand computer or some meeting of all the principalities of the earth. He did so with a seed planted in the womb of a peasant girl. That microscopic seed would one day grow to full life and change the world and die for all our sins. Yes, we often think we have the proper perspective on an issue when in fact we are way off. Unnoticeable things have real influence and that, Jesus says, is what heaven is like. 
Secondly, Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. I've always been very cautious when interpreting the Bible, as everyone should be. Unfortunately, there are some who aren't. Some people, to their own destruction, mangle in their minds the meaning of the scriptures. Their confusion leads them to misinterpret Jesus, Paul, Moses, and all the other teachers and authors of the Bible. A simple example is the text before us today. Jesus has said elsewhere that it's difficult, if not impossible, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But here he says that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. In other words, the kingdom is, is like a lot of loot stashed away somewhere. The difference in these two teachings is this. In one, he's talking about the rich, and the other, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. The criticism of the rich is a direct statement of fact. The illustration about the kingdom being a hidden treasure is a simile. It's a figure of speech, like, the, like using the word like. The kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure is poetry. I get so frustrated when I hear Christians say, I take the Bible literally. You can't take the Bible literally. If we did, it might sound like this. So the kingdom of God is like a man who accidentally discovers a stash of money in some poor old farmer's field. He takes his shovel and buries it again, covering it and putting branches over it so that it looks like untouched ground. He looks over his shoulder to make sure no one has been watching him. He then goes and sells everything he owns so that he can buy the land from the owner who has no idea of the hidden wealth that actually belongs to him. Let me now ask you, is this the kind of kingdom that you want to belong to? Not me. That's not heavenly behavior. It's crooked behavior. You cannot take scripture at face value. You must use your educated mind. We first need to ask ourselves, what am I reading? What type of literature? What was the setting? Why is this being written? What comes after the verse I'm reading? And what comes before? What's the connection? On one page you are reading history. On the next you are reading wisdom literature. On another, teaching. Then a song, a parable, a letter, a teaching, prophecy, poetry, interpretation, theology, and even mythology. You cannot take the Bible literally because it is so many forms of literature. In fact, that is not what they mean. What they mean to say is, I take the Bible to be authoritative. It is the rule for life, both with regard to faith and practice. Let me ask you this. Is the Bible literal or figurative? The answer is both, isn't it? I take the parables to be authoritative, just as I do the historical portions. So when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, you know this is a figure of speech. Jesus is not giving his approval or disapproval to the man's behavior. He is simply using a common action in society to teach us about the uncommon kingdom of heaven. And this heaven Jesus is talking about is not like a rascal who deceives a landowner out of his money. Rather, Jesus is saying, heaven is worth whatever it takes us to get it. Whatever sacrifice we have to make, whatever loss we must endure, whatever trade we have to make to bring heaven into our lives is worth the effort. We must consider, like Paul, everything a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ our Lord and being part of his heaven. That's what heaven is like. Lastly, Jesus said that heaven is like a merchant in search of pearls. And finding the one pearl of great value, he sold all that he had to buy it. This time, it's not a hidden treasure which is found by accident, but a pearl on sale in the marketplace. The merchant finds the precious stone in his daily business. His response that's the important part. 
His response tells us the meaning of Jesus' parable. He sells everything he possesses in order to possess the peril. I like the ancient legend about the monk who found a precious stone, a precious jewel. A short time later, the monk met a traveler who said he was hungry and asked the monk if he, would, if he would share some of his provisions. When the monk opened his bag, the traveler saw the precious stone and an impulse asked the monk if he could have it. Amazingly, the monk gave the traveler the stone. The traveler departed quickly, overjoyed with his new possession. However, a few days later, he came back searching for the monk. He returned the stone to the monk and made a request. Please give me something more valuable, more precious than the stone. Please give me that which enabled you to give me this precious stone. A commitment of the whole heart, that's what heaven, the kingdom of heaven, requires of its followers. I love this last parable because Jesus doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant, a merchant who finds a great deal on a flawless stone and does everything in his power to buy it. Are we prepared to commit ourselves to a greater cause, to sacrifice and hard work? That's what heaven is like. Amen. Let's dedicate our offerings and come before God in prayer. Lord, in the knowledge that we are precious to you, may our thoughtful offering bring comfort, healing and reassurance to your people throughout the world. May the bounty you give us be shared in the love with which it is given. And may we continue to serve you through the giving of ourselves through the giving of ourselves as you have given yourself for us. We praise you, Lord God, for the richness of the parables that root our faith in the ordinary and yet transform it. Lord, we thank you that you are forever at work, even though our human eyes often fail to see or understand what is happening. Increase in us a sense of wonder that we might see signs of your kingdom wherever we are and bless us with the words to tell new stories of your love and grace to all we meet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are saying to us today that heaven is worth whatever it takes to get it. What sacrifice we have to make, whatever loss we must endure, whatever trade we have to make to bring heaven into our lives is worth the effort. We must consider, consider everything as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ our Lord and being part of his heaven. Lord Jesus, you gave everything, even sacrificing your own life for ours. Through your Spirit's guiding, we have found you, the flawless stone, the pearl of great price. Strengthen and encourage each of us to do everything in our power to receive your love mercy, grace, peace, and the eternal life you offer us through Jesus Christ. God of heaven in the everyday and the ordinary, we pray for those searching for the precious pearl of purpose in their lives. We pray for those who are sick, who need healing. Those here in Britain, in America, Brazil, India, and all over the world ravaged by COVID-19. We pray for those searching for peace, living in conflict. We pray for those longing for reconciliation between neighbours and in families. We pray for those yearning for freedom. We pray for those aching for forgiveness. We pray for those who need acceptance. We pray for those longing for comfort. And we pray especially today for the family and friends of Dallas, Dallas Machette and Charlie Burns. And in, the mo in these moments of silence, we bring to you our own prayers.
Lord, surround all your children with your loving arms and grant us your peace. To you, Lord of love, we entrust these and all our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, teach us we are never so small, so insignificant as to be of low value to you. Help us to know how precious we are. As we go, cast us into the world. Show us where to go that we might meet the world's need from the bounty of gifts and talent stored in the treasure chest of the person you have made us to be. And hear us as we say together, the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today, tomorrow and forever. Amen. <laughs>